So I want to talk about muscle, uh, motor units, and smooth muscle. So first I want to talk about skeletal muscle motor unit. A motor unit is one neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. So here's one motor unit. There's one motor neuron and often multiple synapses on individual muscle fibers. They're big and so they're spread out over that muscle fiber. And when that motor unit, when that muscle, motor neuron fires, it produces full twitch in every single fiber. Here's a second one that I'm drawing right now, and that's a second motor unit. So if we fire just one, we get a half strength contraction. If we fire two, we get a full strength contraction. Um, and if we fire none, we get no contraction at all. In this case, the cells are producing action potentials, and the cells are not electrically connected. So we need a synapse, at least one, on every single muscle cell. How does vertebrate skeletal muscle and smooth muscle get regulated? What I want to talk about now is the ways in which muscles can be regulated. Vertebrate smooth muscle and skeletal muscle can be regulated by uh, in what are called motor units. A vertebrate smooth muscle in which there are single motor units. Um, those motor units each control a patch of muscle cells. They're connected by gap junctions. Uh, gap junctions, remember, are a tube connecting two cells. Their proteins are connexins. And they're like little donuts connecting or little tubes connecting two cells. So when you get an action potential coming down that neuron, releases neurotransmitter at every synapse, that neurotransmitter starts an action potential which of course spreads out through that cell, but cations, sodium or potassium, get pushed through, uh, repelled through those connexins into the neighboring cells and generate action potentials in those new cells. And so a single neuron going to a subset of all of the cells can send an action potential spreading through all the cells and produce contractions in all of those cells. Okay, there's an alternate. Um, in smooth muscle, the cells can also have no gap junctions and not be able to produce action potentials. So in that case, what happens is that the axons spread out across the cells and at varying points they have little bulges called varicosities. Those varicosities, and varicosity just means um, a bulge. Uh, or a bump. So those varicosities each contain neurotransmitter. So these little blue dots are representing vesicles of neurotransmitter. And at each action potential, neurotransmitter is released at each of those varicosities. So an action potential moves down the axon, releases its neurotransmitter. Okay. In, in this kind of smooth muscle, the neurotransmitter from a varicosity, and here's a varicosity. So vesicles of neurotransmitter. And when the action potential moves down along this axon, that opens voltage-gated calcium channels located at the varicosity, and that triggers the events that cause fusion of the vesicles with the membrane and release of the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter binds to the receptors and there are multiple types of receptors uh, in these kinds of, but not uncommonly is a G protein coupled receptor. And when it's a G protein coupled receptor, remember G protein is activated, interacts with adenylate cyclase, cyclic AMP, uh, can be other mechanisms. Of course, cyclic AMP may open a calcium channel, and there's calcium entry into that cell. So at this point, we're um, fairly similar to what we've talked about for skeletal muscle, except the amount of calcium entry has depended upon the amount of neurotransmitter. Smooth muscle is often myosin regulated. So here's a single myosin head and four actins. There's the same role for ATP, ADP, and phosphate in muscle contraction uh, in, the in the powering the myosin ATPase, the myosin head, which uses ATP for movement, so it's an ATPase. ADP and phosphate, again in the cocked position. But in the case of myosin-regulated muscle, we have to wait for something else. 
myosin light chain kinase, myosin light chain kinase phosphorylates that myosin, specifically the myosin light chain. Calcium binds to calmodulin, that binds to MLCK, and the combination, uh, that change in conformation, results in phosphorylation of the myosin head. So with phosphorylation, myosin head changes conformation, and now in this new conformation can bind to actin. Okay. There's no tropomyosin or troponin on the actin in this case, and so once the myosin's activated, they can immediately start interacting with those actins. But of course, only the activated ones can do so. So again, we still have the same role for ADP, uh, ATP, uh, ADP and phosphate, and as long as that um, phosphate, the green phosphate, is on here, we get repeated cycles of contraction, and with each cycle, we move the actins a little bit further along. So cycling continues with myosin activated muscle as long as calcium is present, just as is the case in actin regulated muscle. But when the calcium is gone, there's an enzyme that dephosphorylases. That dephosphorylase removes it, and all these other events stop. So why the difference? Why have actin regulated versus myosin regulated muscle? So what does actin regulated muscle do? Well it's fast and complete. Once calcium gets in there, a single calcium can activate a calmodulin which exposes a bunch of actin binding sites, and at that point all myosins are available. So you get a full strength contraction. That muscle cell um, can allow every single myosin to interact with every actin. Whereas with myosin regulated muscle it's quite different. With few calcium you get only a few myosins activated. And so you get a very light contraction, like picking up a very light piece of paper. With more calcium you get stronger contraction, and if you saturate with calcium you get every single myosin head is active. And so the strength of contraction depends upon the amount of calcium and therefore the amount of neurotransmitter released and of course that goes back to the number of action potentials per second. So if you think about a muscle, uh, invertebrate skeletal muscle, um, what I'm dra drawing here are a bunch of different colored cells and each cell is part of a different motor unit. And so we have an orange or brown one here, we have a green one, and a red one, and of course I'm skipping some. And when we get a contraction in each neuron, those muscle cells contract, and they contract completely. They get a full twitch. So if you want a weak contraction, you fire a very few motor units, but each individual motor unit either contracts completely or not. So low energy contraction, just a few motor units. With smooth muscle, if they're connected by, if cells are connected by gap junctions, you again, you get a contraction from uh, every action potential. But if it's myosin regulated, you get um, different strength of contraction depending upon how many neurotransmitter, how much neurotransmitter, and how many. Um, uh, calciums enter, and so you can get weaker or stronger contractions depending on the frequency of action potential, and it's very cheap control. One neuron does all of this. Um, it doesn't tend to be very fast, it's not very specific, and so each patch of cells is controlled. On the other hand, if you have very small smooth muscles, which is true for a lot of things, so here's a, here's a muscle that has only four cells in total, so it's from a very small animal. One action potential results in release of just a little bit of neurotransmitter. You get a few neurotransmitters, therefore a few myosins activated. It's a light contraction. But with more action potentials per second, many action potentials here, there's much more neurotransmitter release. You may get to all of the myosin heads activated and a full strength contraction. In other words, in principle, a single neuron can control that whole muscle. 
Okay, a single neuron can control the whole muscle and it can give you weak or strong contraction. Of course, there's a risk. If that single neuron is injured or dies, then you lose control of the whole muscle. In many invertebrate muscles, there are two excitatory and one inhibitory neurons, and each one innervates every single muscle. So they have varicosities. So here's an excitatory one, often a sodium channel. An inhibitory neuron could be potassium or chloride quite commonly. And then a second excitatory So there are two pathways for excitation at different strengths and one way to inhibit that muscle. So three neurons for the entire muscle. It's relatively cheap control and you have a range possible of from very light contractions to complete full strength contraction depending on the number of, of action potentials per second.